The following program you're about to watch contains ideas and opinions. If you are easily offended by ideas or opinions, I suggest you refrain from watching this. Hey everybody and welcome to Scrub Talk with Diesel, where I, Diesel, rail at you, the listener, for being a scrub. Today I've had a lot of thought over um, different topics in order to facilitate better gameplay. And we've talked about things that will help you on a personal level, but we haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of what you can do to better improve your gameplay. And I came up with a good topic that I think will benefit everyone in accelerating their gameplay to a higher level. And that topic is information. When I say information, I'm talking about the things that you know during the course of a game. Now, in a lot of games, information can be divvied up into two different categories. That's perfect information and imperfect information. And within imperfect information, there is a couple more things that are uh, to know open and closed. But I'll go through all those piece by piece. In general, we're going to be talking a little bit here about what is called game theory. Now, game theory is not just related to card games, but to all games. And the definition of game is actually broader than what you're normally used to. This is a lot of high-level math, and a lot of people aren't going to understand every inch of it. So I'm not going to go deep into the concept, but I am going to give you sort of a crash course in the first couple lessons that you do of game theory in order to better explain information. So let's start with perfect information and what it is. Perfect information is the idea that both players within this two-player game have exact knowledge of everything that's going on between them and the opponent. The most classic example of perfect information is tic-tac-toe. Both players in tic-tac-toe have all the information that they need to know. Both players know exactly how to play the game. They know where their opponent has moved. And they know what kind of things to expect from their opponent. Because of this, players can gain or lose an advantage on the perfect knowledge that they see in front of them. While the, I would say that the opposite of perfect information is no information, another segment of information that we can talk about is imperfect information. That is, information that we don't have all of, but pieces of, in order to figure out things. Now, there are certain things in all card games that tend to be considered perfect knowledge, knowledge that you and your opponent both have. That would be the number of cards in each other's hands, the number of cards in one's discard pile, the number of cards in one's deck, and even other little things such as what turn it is, um, how many of a certain card that somebody has played, and so on and so forth. And any cards that are up on the board are also information that both you and your opponent have. Imperfect information gets split into two categories open and closed. The things that I just talked about are all open sources of information. They're things that you can see and know without ever having to ask your opponent for anything. It's polite to ask your opponent to hold their cards, but it's not necessary in order for you to say how many cards are in your hand? Four. How many cards are in your discard pile? 12. How many cards are left in your deck? 33. These things are to be known by each player at all times. Open information also includes knowing things like specific cards in someone's hand, which you might know in Vanguard because of a uh, drive check, or in Buddy Fight because of a card that allowed you to see your opponent's hand. In Magic, very much allowing to see someone's hand is a way to get open information. Closed information is the stuff that you don't know. Like, what cards are in my hand that you did not get a chance to see? 
what cards are left in my deck that you've never seen before. As time passes, your knowledge becomes more open through the course of the game. Any game that is. And the benefits of having open information is it allows you to strategize a plan of attack. But sometimes players will change something in their deck. Uh, obviously, Magic has the side deck, which is 15 cards that someone's allowed to change into that gives you another chance to close information off from your opponent. And there are also mechanics and whatnot that can keep things hidden from your opponent. These kind of things are good to have in a game because it does allow a measure of secrecy. And it allows you to come up with a plan that doesn't require your opponent knowing about what's going on. The name of the game when it comes to information is trying to gain more information than your opponent. And that requires you to convert closed information into open information. How do you do this? Well, let's just talk about any singular card game. Within a card game, generally the rules tend to follow certain patterns. Uh, you shuffle each other, you shuffle your deck, and your opponent shuffles theirs. And then both players are allowed to present for a cut. This cut allows you to keep your opponent from having information about what the top card of their deck is going to be. Um, some games allow you a shuffle instead of a cut, uh, and other games don't. But in general, this works out for everything. Um, then both players tend to draw their hand and set up the board. When setting up the board, the field stays more or less empty, and all information stays closed. Your hand is your hand, and your opponent has no idea what's in it, theoretically. <clears throat> and your hand, and theirs is theirs, and you don't know what's in it, theoretically. So what you need to do is turn information into open information through use of playing the game. Opening the field, in particular, is talking about the field of the board in general. So, if you are playing a game of something, usually you have to place monsters or creatures or whatever you want to call them onto the board in order to attack your opponent to do what is inevitably life point damage in order to win the game. So, in a game like Magic, one of the ways that you can open your opponent's field is force them to play things. When they are forced to play things, their hand becomes less of a mystery and their field becomes an open book for you to read. In card fight, there's also the act of driving, which is the taking the top card of the deck and flipping it face up to reveal if there's any triggers. That card goes into the hand of the player who did the drive which means you now know one card that is in their hand, theoretically. This is a game of memory for most people, and you have to be very careful about what you give away throughout the course of a game. Good ways of converting info is using cards that make your opponent reveal things, using cards that force them to play things, and talking through with your opponent. Now, I'm going to get into some stuff later that talks about shadier ways of converting info, but in general, these ways are known to be used in every competitive level tournament, and some of them are very innocuous. Um, in Magic, you may play a black deck, which focuses on discard and killing your opponent's creatures. So, killing their creatures forces them to play more, and getting to discard from their hand can often reveal to you everything that's in their hand, and if it doesn't, it still limits the options that they have, and your knowledge base grows with that limitation. Let me talk a little bit about mistakes. Mistakes are things that you do during a game, obviously, that are things that you did not intend to do. Uh, misplays fall into the realm of mistakes. The idea that 
you are supposed to play a turn a particular way, and you instead play it the wrong way. Mistakes have the unfortunate uh, side effect of letting information slip on occasion. Let me ask you guys if you've ever done this. You're in the middle of a game with someone. You're flipping cards in your hand, relaxing, and all of a sudden you drop one and it lands face up. Your opponent has a chance to see this card before you get to pick it up. They now have an info that they might not have had before because of your mistake. This kind of thing happens a lot, especially when players are impatient or overzealous. Because they're in a hurry and they're anxious and they do stuff that causes them to have problems holding on to their cards. Something else I'm doing in this picture is that my hand is kind of laid out flat. Your hand should never be laid out in such a way that your opponent has a chance to peek at it. And while I'll talk about the ethics, good or bad, of doing those kind of things later, the point is, is that the damage is done the second they see your cards. So you have to be very careful about holding your hand in such a way that they can't see it. About not doing things that would give you an opportunity to drop cards. Or if you're shuffling, shuffling slow enough and methodically enough so that you don't flip a card onto the table. Um, mistakes are often the way that players tend to lose games. And I'm not saying that every game you lose is because of a mistake. In fact, I think players who think that should remember, you're, you're bad. bad! But when it comes to actual play mistakes, play errors, it usually has to do with being too quick about playing your turn or wanting your opponent to be too quick about playing theirs. Mistakes are also made when it comes to communication between players. Sometimes you're looking at a card in your hand that you want to do later. Your opponent can see you looking at your cards, and they have a notion of what card you might be looking at. That's information that they shouldn't use, or they shouldn't have, but they do, and they can use it as they see fit. So you got to be careful about cards that ask you to discard a card at random, or to have your opponent choose a card without looking at it, uh, in order to discard it, because those things fall under mistakes if you've given your opponent any information on where you keep cards stored in your hand. The game that I always think of when it comes to these kind of play errors and mistakes is actually an old bicycle deck game called Go Fish. Everyone knows how to play gold, Go Fish. You ask your opponent if they have any of a certain number, and if they have it, they give it to you. And if they don't, they say go fish and you draw a card. But how many times do you know players who fix their hand according to biggest and smallest number? So if you know for a fact that they've got twos, and they put something right next to it on one side, you might assume that those are threes. And the more that they keep their hand neat and nice, the easier it is for you to guess what kind of things that they have in their hand. This is a player, a mistake. And letting that info slip can be very dangerous in the competitive setting, especially since not all players play on the same playing field. Breaking into one of the last topics on this is obviously ethics. Now for those of you who've only heard the word in passing, ethics means being bound by a certain code that makes it that you do either the right or the wrong thing morally. Now I'm not going to get into morals of different players or anything that makes people think that some people are good and some people are bad. We all know that. We're all adults and we all try to think the best of people but expect that sometimes things will go awry. This is the thing about ethics when it comes to information. What information can or should you use as a player. Now, speaking at the highest competitive level, your opponent, you can expect, will use any information that they have 
in order to improve their game against you. That being said, you should do the same because you should expect that level of play from your opponent. A lot of intermediate players go into bigger events thinking about it that players are just going to be nice and let you take things back and let you uh, put things down in a specific order. And these kind of things aren't true. Not always, at least. And while it would be nice if we could all love the games first and then play the games as perfectly as we can, secondly, we all know that that's not always the case. So since your opponent is planning to use any information that they can gather against you, you should be willing to do the same. And that's okay. You're at a competitive scene, and this is to be expected. Okay? But you should also think about what is an ethically correct way of dealing with certain things. And I'll give you an example using magic. This is brought to you, uh, in part, paraphrased by uh, Patrick Shapin, one of the uh, world's best magic players, at least according to record, and, uh, in my opinion, a very upstanding player. Um, Patrick Shapin once was talking about the magic scene as it used to be. Way back in the old days, uh, magic had particular rules that had to be dealt with at any major event. One of them was that you had to use cards from every set that existed up to that point. Um, alpha and Beta being excluded, of course. But you would have to use some cards from Unlimited and some cards from Aladdin's Lamp. and Or Arabian Nights, I'm sorry. And some cards from uh, Ice Age, when Ice Age came out. And all of this turned things into a deck that was guaranteed to have one card at least of every set that had come out before. That was a way to promote people buying stuff from before, of course, but also to uh, try to get people to expand their knowledge of how to play the game. The problem was they also had a rule that you could not sleeve your decks. Uh, card sleeves back then were uh, interesting to get anyway. Most of them were clear because baseball cards were the number one thing, so you wanted to see both sides of the card. And so even if you could sleeve, you didn't have the options of solid color backs as we have today. The problem was is that because they printed with different groups, there were perceptible differences between the backs of certain cards in order to uh, tell the sets apart from one another. <clears throat> and an intermediate player not, may not catch this, but an, a professional player surely does. And they were able to tell the difference between each person's cards enough to know what set their cards were from. If you break that down into the cards that you would play at a competitive level, that meant that there was one card, Strip Mine, that was pretty much the only playable card from a particular set, and so everybody ran one of it. And this was the only card of that set which you could perceptibly see the difference of in other people's decks. You could also pretty perceptively see when your opponent had a basic land or not a basic land, given the situation. Because of the way the tournaments were situated, you would shuffle and your opponent would have an opportunity to shuffle back. This created a situation where experienced players would take an opponent's deck and shuffle it so that their strip mine was on top and then no basic lands would be within the next seven cards or eight cards or ten cards if they were really good at doing what they were doing. This meant that your opponent had absolute knowledge that you would get to draw this one land and no others for at least three turns. That kind of information was a boon for expert players versus intermediate players. <clears throat> it's also ethically reprehensible. This is, in my opinion, the highest form of cheating. Stacking another player's deck in such a way that they will not be able to hit the resources that they require to even function in a game. And every player did it. 
it was considered the norm to shuffle your opponent's deck in a way that starved them for the first few turns. And the community didn't fight it as much as they probably should have. Now, I believe that the Magic community has grown in a lot of ways since then, and has become a community where most players feel like they can do their best and not have to worry about these moral gray areas. But there is still the odd player here and there who will take advantage of information that they shouldn't have. Somehow you let your deck slip and they saw everything, and it's not their fault that the, you did that, that your deck ended up being seen. But it's there, and it's real. And then they have to commit, should I use that information? Okay? Now, like I said before, whatever your opponent is going to use, they're going to have, they're going to use against you. And you should be prepared to do the same thing. However, remember that if you can build up a notion of things that you are willing and aren't willing to do in order to win a game, then you come out as the ethically better player. And this doesn't mean much on the floor, but it means a lot to casual play, to your locals, and if you are a competitive player who has, is considered to be a role model amongst other players, it means a lot to the people who look up to you. So, that's my idea of what you should do when it comes to ethics. That being said, make sure that you play at a level that lets you get information as much as you can without breaking rules and limit your opponent's information as much as you can without breaking rules. Since we're on the topic of opening or closing information to your opponent, I feel like we should talk a little bit about misleading one. Misleading an opponent is purportedly giving them information that may not be accurate. Now, let me be clear on this. I am not talking about cheating and uh, giving them a lie if a card allows them to know something about your hand, you need to follow that rule. However, something I've done in the past, and many competitive players do, is mislead their opponent into thinking something that they might not have within the confines of the rules. So, going back to card fight. In card fight, uh, for those players who don't play, there's something that we call perfect shields. These cards can be placed to guard and you discard a card from your hand and it makes it so that whatever would have hit you during that battle does not. It's a very useful type of card for when your opponent is building up gigantic numbers in order to hit you. The thing about perfect guards though is that there's only four in a deck. And your opponent is not privy to when you do and do not have them in your hand. Unless, of course, they are face up somewhere where they can see them, being the damage zone, the drop zone, or on the board. They might also know whether or not you have one in your hand based on the cards that you drew. So what I will often do is, if there's something that I drew in a way that I had to show to my opponent, like driving... I would use that card before using other cards in my hand. This keeps the closed information very high uh, against my opponent. My opponent can read only the cards that they know that I've pulled and can only guess about the cards that they haven't seen. So I will give them the idea of being able to block something by, say looking at what they've got on board, looking at my hand, and then going, hmm, okay, go. Putting these two cards down is not against the rule, and keeping them closed for my opponent is what I'm supposed to do. But I give my opponent the impression that I have a perfect guard and a card to discard for that perfect guard, and it makes them react in a way 
that is playing against the perfect shield. Now, whether or not that perfect shield is actually in my hand, they don't know, and I'll never tell. But using that deception, that minor bluff, gives me something of an edge over an opponent that I wouldn't have had before. Understand that this sort of misleading is dangerous. You have to be good at it. You have to have what people call a poker face, where you don't give anything away in your expression. But if you get good at this, it is one of the most useful skills of a competitive player. And that's the end of today's Scrub Talk with Diesel. I hope you guys use the information that I've given you about information to make yourself a better, more developed player. Um, also, I kind of want to talk about something that I saw earlier this week. Uh, a friend of mine who is a fo uh, listener of Scrub Talk decided that uh, he was going to do the thing that I asked you to do in episode one. Look at yourself in the mirror. Hold up a deck so that you don't feel like you're berating yourself over something else. And I want you to honestly look at yourself and say, I am bad. And he made a video of it. Uh, it should end up being in one of the replies on a Facebook link of this, and I will try to put a uh, message of it in the description. I would love to see those people who truly like Scrub Talk to go up to the, and do the thing that I asked you to do and make a video of it. And if I get enough videos, I will post them at the beginning as my opening, or I will make a compilation of them, and I will truly show that there's no shame in being a scrub. Keep scrubbing, my friends. Mm -hmm.